Okay then. Hello and welcome to the seventh of our Minds and Money Five at Five shows. For those of you attending uh, Five at Five for the first time, the aim of Five at Five, five guests at 5 p.m. is to maintain engagement between investors and miners and the mining industry through a lively interactive format during the current situation. A few admin announcements before we uh, proceed. To make it as interactive as possible, please have your videos uh, switched on. It would be good to see what all of you look like. Um, also, um, if you have a question, you have a couple of options. You can either submit them via the chat function, which is at the bottom of your screen, or you can also go and wave your hands via the participants uh, function. I will then unmute you and you can then ask your question live. We'll also be having polling questions throughout the webinar as well. And, um, and, and we'll be having three polling questions throughout the uh, session. Um, now, um, uh, now, without further ado, we've got a star-studded uh, lineup of guests. So I would like to go and hand you over to this week's host, who is Jochen Steiger, founder and chief editor of Commodity TV, a pioneer in online mining channels with over 1.2 million viewers and counting. A warm welcome to Jochen Steiger. Hey Andrew, thank you very much and also very warm welcome to all the participants and as it is my second time, really enjoying it. So the last event was already of 147, so I hope we're going uh, really above this number. And yeah, as Andrew said, my name is Jochen Steiger. I'm the chief editor and founder of Commodity TV and uh, also Rohstoff TV. And uh, yeah, 5x5 five five is a fantastic format. We want to have it as interactive as possible. So please feel free to use the chat function and all also to wave your hands, that would be fantastic. Um, before I start to introduce the panelists, as Andrew mentioned already, we have several pollings here and we have the first poll and this has to do with me, of course, and uh, those who are visiting Minds and Money uh, Fair regularly um, know me uh, that uh, I'm not wearing those black and uh, gray and boring suits, which you are used as London bankers normally. Um, I'm a little bit more the colorful guy because I'm so skinny and so uh, small. And um, so what colors of trousers do I have today? <laughs> so start your polling, please. Uh-huh, it's interesting, I see it, uh-huh. <laughs> the last one, Jesus Christ, okay, I like it. Yeah, while you guys are polling, uh, let me introduce our uh, panelists today. First of all, we have David Street, who is the co-founder and CEO of Tembo Capital. Welcome, David. Then we have my friend Craig Perry, the CEO of ISO Energy. Craig, very warm welcome to Vancouver. And then we have also here Tommy Horton, the Vice President Business Development of Gianni Metals and Chair of the Association of Mining Analyst Tommy, very warm welcome. Schönen guten Tag, as you speak also German. And then my good friend, Professor Dr. Thorsten Denin, who is uh, the head of uh, private, uh, head of uh, private, uh, po sorry, portfolio management of the asset management in Switzerland called the AMSAG in Zurich. Thorsten, very warm welcome. Yeah, so let's see what the poll results are looking. Mina, are you doing that, doing that or shall I end the poll? Can in the poll, so you want yes. to check them. Share results, okay. Yeah. And it is uh, red, actually. Oh. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought I have to stick to it, yeah? Because normally, mine's and money, I have the first day, I have a red one, second day is a green one, and then it goes over to yellow and brown, so that's fine. Super, fantastic. Guys, let's get started, and uh, I hope everybody has a drink. Also for those people like in Vancouver who are in the morning because it makes life much easier these days. And um, <laughs> let us start with uh, Thorsten Denin. And uh, Thorsten, as well as you are the, the uh, head of uh, portfolio management of asset management Switzerland, you are also a best-selling author. And the book is named From Tulips to Bitcoins. Maybe you can hold it up. It's a fantastic book, honestly. And I really like it. And uh, I got the honor to uh, write the preface for it. And it's a history of fortunes made and lost in the commodity markets. And uh, yeah, Thorsten, the big question here for all of us is, are there any lessons from history and your book as to where commodity fortunes will be made and lost in the commodity markets and maybe what it looks like today? It looks like today. <laughs> Thank you, Jochen, very much. Thank it's always Jochen. a pleasure uh, to, to join in here. 
Uh, and I'm very happy also to pronounce that we have now a preferred language available uh, also for our Russian speaking guests uh, in that book. And uh, having like 400 years of commodity market investments from tulips to Bitcoin, yeah, covering uh, actually like an, a very good comment from uh, also my, my friend from, from Redford Cook, from uh, CEO of Endeavor Silver, who said uh, for the comments, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes, yeah? Quoting another famous guy with that. <laughs> it's Sandra, I see that point, it's not a original from him, but it really, <laughs> when you look into the book and you see, for example, the crude oil market going from, from $4 to $40 to $150, to $20 back to $100 and now down to zero down the grain, uh, now back to $20. You see like a roller coaster and that's only the crude market. Uh, everything we've seen before also on the gold side, you have a gold market shooting up to $2,000 in terms of inflation adjusted prices and the 80, uh, the silver, silver going down uh, up to 50 bucks, going down to four bucks. Um, you name it, uh, uranium, uh, the big uranium uh, run we had seen, maybe the big uranium market run is about to come in the coming years. We probably see, uh, see in that a little bit later, but now the precious metals are shining. So there's lots of rhymes in the commodity market and speculation, a lot of interesting stories from the mining industry. And if you're interested in, uh, in the mining and in the commodity sphere, I think this is a nice collection of 42 uh, interesting stories from all over the commodity world. Mm -hmm. that, that was really fast. Thank you very much. Uh, of course, uh, as you were talking about the oil industry, let me allow uh, the first question. Do you think the shale oil industry, meaning also the fracking in the, in the US, is history? Yeah, so history it becomes history when it's history. Um, looking at the fracking industry in this perspective, no, don't you worry. Uh, I just started the class. It's not uh, as late as you think you're back in Switzerland. <laughs> Yeah. The fracking industry definitely is not making any money, but if you look at hatching positions in the industry, uh, look at uh, how much barrels uh, every of the small and medium and small guys have hatched to the end of the year, they might survive, but it's a question about how long. If the oil price staying at the 20, 25, even to 30 level for a couple of months, we definitely will see in the shale oil industry a roll in of, uh, of bankruptcies. And this is not even uh, the amount uh, what we see here on the high yield market, on the credit market, the spread from the credit maybe also to the equity market, not to talk about employment. As for my uh, second uh, profession, I'm economist, I'm uh, uh, looking into these, uh, these macro numbers, what the shale oil industry could uh, become from a spillover effect. So um, it might be the, the edge that Corona might push like one of the domino stones here into the right thing to see like the US economy really crumble. That's my fear uh, because uh, we see lots of geopolitical instability in the Middle East about the hegemony, about Saudi Arabia, about the stability of OPEC, about other countries in Latin America, look at Venezuela, about the oil reserves, look about uh, European countries, um, about the oil price. There's lots of frictions now in the system regarding to the oil price and as long as it stays in this direction about this high storage because uh, the economy is grounded about the corona level uh, i think the us is the dominant uh, domino uh, effect uh, we might try to avoid but i hope so and cross mm -hmm. my finger it uh, might become with only like a 10 to 15 percent bankruptcy rate in, in the sector only fantastic martin french is asking what is your outlook for copper my outlook Yes. Actually, my outlook for the copper market is a bit more, uh, better uh, compared to the crude outlook we've seen uh, so far. Um, as for the coming months, the crude uh, in terms of the oversupply about the grounding is, uh, is very weak. I think uh, on the same, uh, both crude and copper are at the fundamental price level. If you have the time for like six uh, to 12 month horizon and longer, uh, both are at a fantastic stage in terms of buying in time. Uh, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't uh, rule out that copper on a pound base uh, in the US is trading down to $2 and below the $2 uh, in the coming uh, coming months because of the corona effect about the lockdown of the economy. I don't hope so. This is my worst case scenario, but this would be for me a buying opportunity in some of the big copper names uh, going forward. Yeah, because the copper, uh, we can't exclude the copper from the economic process. The copper is for the metal side and for the growth uh, more uh, even uh, same, same important than the, the crude market, despite smaller. Uh, but the short-term outlook definitely is bad. 
Yeah, because look at the economic numbers, 25% down in GDP for the US, it must have an effect on copper demand. Yeah, I mean, sorry to weigh in here, but uh, yeah, Tulsa, I'd, I'd agree with you if the, if the wheels of the, of the supply chain were well oiled, but I think as a result of, uh, of Corona, like we've seen uh, the, the supply chain totally break down. I mean, not only from, from the mine site perspective, but you know, there's, uh, it takes a lot to get concentrate from a mine to a smelter and then to, to whatever refined um, product it goes into. So, yeah, I, you know, I, I'm personally, I'm actually pretty, pretty bullish on copper purely for that reason. You know, I, I you know, and, and I think Krona is, uh, you know, there's still parts of the world where you've got uh, mines that are quite labor intensive where, yeah, you're, yeah, uh, you, you've probably got- I would, I would bet with you just in case of a time horizon, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then there's another question from Karim Musenmetz. This is uh, the name I, which is shown here, probably a short form. Uh, what is the outlook for zinc, zinc and silver? <laughs> Tommy, if you want, or Thorsten, doesn't matter. Uh, Karim Musenmetz, I don't know. That's an uh, acronym. <laughs> oh, you want to start? Yes, please. For zinc and silver, what is the outlook? What do you think? Do you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Was a bit. Yeah, on, on, uh, on zinc and silver. I mean, zinc uh, is a small, a small brother in, in terms of the industrial metal complex. Um, it's, it's bound to the copper side. I, I would uh, uh, battle you on, on, on the times of horizon. I'm bullish uh, the copper and the best metal complex uh, on the medium to longer term. But I think uh, the, the worst in terms of pricing is in the short term in front of us. Uh, even uh, with uh, this, this, uh, this economic situation. Um, on the silver side, we've seen like a huge underperformance of, uh, of silver in regard to, to the leading precious metal now in the crisis. Um, because as we said, only one thing is money, that's gold, and only the gold price was rising. Uh, silver is still with $15, uh, and uh, yesterday traded below the $15 range. Uh, as, as well as uh, platinum, for example, trading below the $800 range. Um, all the other precious metals have been uh, at huge discount because every investor is flocking into security and into gold, uh, leading into a gold-silver ratio uh, above 115. So if you look at 70 years, of, uh, 70 years plus history, that's like an amazing uh, gold-silver ratio. And uh, I think this ratio comes in the medium term uh, back to a normal stage, like to a 60 to, to 70. And this would reflect to a $25, $30 silver range. Um, if, you got the, uh, if you got a little bit of uh, nerves in terms of that, because the silver market, of course, is a smaller market. It's higher, higher volatility as the gold market. So therefore, you can expect it maybe to trade down again uh, to, uh, to a 14, even to a 12 level in terms of some volatile events. But the medium term outlook, I'm at this level a big fan of a silver market if you have the nerves and uh, the risk appetite. I would stay away from, from the pure base metal. I'm not talking about the minus here, I'm just talking about the pure commodity uh, exposure in the short term. Um, would still avoid lots of the base metal long exposure, but flock into the gold market and build the silver and platinum uh, aside for the coming months. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, do we have any waving hands? Because I cannot see that. Uh, Mina or Andrew? Um, no, we don't. No, um, not. Okay, then I have a question to uh, go over there um, to also to our next guest. But before that, I want to ask you, as we have with Craig Perry, one of the top-notch uh, geologists here in uranium as a guest. So what is your feeling on uranium? Because to me, it looks a little bit like the situation 2006 and 7 before it really started off. Uh, that's a bit of my yeah, personal feeling or let's say market watch I'm doing. Also, the chart looks to me quite bullish. $34 is a breakout for me. And... Uh, what I'm hearing uh, from utilities and from the ground, or let's say whispering on the floor, it looks like uh, that a lot of buyers are getting really nervous. I had a, an interesting dinner uh, with uh, Cameco some, uh, oh, Jesus Christ, 10, 10 weeks ago. And uh, yeah, it was very interesting what I heard there. So what is your view on that, Thorsten? And also Tommy, if you like. On, uh, outlook uranium. On the uranium, yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, yeah, Craig, Craig's a pro here, but I mean, I'm I'm very bullish uranium. I mean, you know, there's only what 10% of the overall supplies in the, in the spot market, and so mm -hmm. as as history has shown pre the financial crisis, you know, it's uh, 
it's very uh, susceptible to supply shocks. And we're going through one of those at the moment. So, you know, we've got a fairly constant demand outlook because, you know, energy is, you know, uh, uranium is a base load. So, you know, your demand outlook is not going to change too much. It's only reflected by increases in um, uh, power plant construction. But when you get supply shocks, it, it really does react. And, you know, this the market's been pretty, pretty dead since sort of Fukushima, really. And, you know, I've been an underlying uranium bull but uh i'm, I'm uh, yeah i'm i'm very positive on, on the moment you know um so uh cameco have i think everything's offline at cameco at the moment right um uh, and, it is yeah. yeah and and also it's going to take it's going to take a while for new supply to come back online you know you've got you've got stockpile companies like uranium corp and um uh yellow cake but you know, in terms of sort of future outlook uh, on on consistent production in terms of the market, there's not really not anything there. I mean, take Boss Resources, for example, that, you know, they've got all the infrastructure and permits ready to go, but still they've got to raise the finance in order to put it in a production. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that takes some time, you know, banks move slowly. Um, you know, if you, even if you go to the uh, spec mining uh, uh, private equity guys, I mean, you know, even, even then, you know, you, you, you take a, you take take I take a while, so I, I can see this market really moving. I mean, Craig knows far more about this than than I do. That's and then he will he will talk about it for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Dost, do you want to add something? Yeah, I'm just uh, thinking back uh, two years ago when I was adjusting my uranium price outlook like three times before the market ended uh, from 25 to 20 and when it was trading below below the 20 bucks, remember, like at 18. And all the time I had to like rewrite my outlook in, uh, in about two week time. So this was basically like a horrible, horrible time. Uh, for, for the analysts, for the portfolio management, and of course for the mining side, <laughs> when you remember that. And I remember yeah. also our interviews on an annual basis because I think the yeah. uranium segment uh, in the mining is a very interesting one um, in the in the in the long term because it's neglected from everybody. It's neglected from the uh, utilities. It's neglected from the mining analysts because um, it's so much smaller than the copper. It's so much smaller uh, and insignificant mm -hmm. than the gold side. So when you talk uranium, you say, oh, who wants to talk uranium? about uranium stocks right but there are some pearls in it and at the right time at the right price and now uh, i agree here with, uh, with tommy on that uh, the price is really moving uh this week when we, we touched the 30 35 and 36 dollars on the uranium uh, spot market again and slowly the price i think is coming back to the 40 to 45 ish dollar range mm. and then i think some some interest is coming back in the market and uh, yeah, for utility start until you're over 40 Exactly. And it, for utility, it doesn't make a, a difference if uh, uranium price that they're sourcing from is 50, 60 or 80 dollars in, in terms of uh, for purchasing. And they're holding back with, uh, uh, with purchases for, for a long time now. And when you see the growth from the, from the nuclear power plants in, uh, in Asia alone or in China, uh, just to reduce the, um, uh, the, the environmental effect from the coal fired plants that we have here, um, it overcompensates uh, what we've seen in the US or in uh, for example, in, in Germany or a little bit from the restart uh, in, in Japan, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Super. Yeah. All right. We're going to move a little bit forward because otherwise Andrew is killing me time-wise. And uh, thank you very much, Thorsten. Also, thank you, Tommy, for your comments. Uh, before we come to Craig Perry, we have another poll going on. And the question is, are uranium companies now more or less attractive as an investment? So, Mina, can you bring up the polling, please? Great. So while, while you guys are voting, uh, let me introduce our second guest, Craig Perry, the CEO of ISO Energy. And for disclosure reasons, I should uh, tell you that I'm a shareholder of the company. ISO Energy is a well-funded uranium exploration and development company with a portfolio of prospective projects that sit in the Athabasca Basin in Saskatchewan, the heart of uranium in the world. I'm sure that he'll be telling you why uranium is now more attractive as an investment and why ISO Energy is a great opportunities. So where are the results? I think uh, we can probably end the poll. I will do that. Zack. Uh -huh. So slightly more attractive. Okie dokie. Interesting. <laughs> I'm, I must say I'm also a super uranium bull, but uh, yeah, it is what it is. We will see what comes out of that. So Craig Perry, the floor is yours. Thanks, Jochen. Thank you. For, and thank you for Andrew and uh, for Mina for having us on and arranging this. 
Uh, good, good to be speaking with everyone, and I hope you're all you're all well. Um, some good uh, good commentary there. I, I really enjoyed that, and I think Mina, you've probably got a few sli slides there for me that you can put up. Yeah. Um, but uh, you, you know, rather than sort of killing you with PowerPoint, Sorry. I think that there's sort of three three key things that we're observing just at the moment in the market. Firstly, of course, as, as Jock and Torsten and Tommy have alluded to, there you, you're seeing you know, very dramatic closures. And I think you'll see that, Mina, on that very first slide we've got up there. Uh, if you go oh, back a one. couple. Which, yeah. which sort of sums up sums up the situation, of course. You, you know, COVID-related closures uh, have been a, the biggest issue in the sector. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a sector, you, you know, supply demand, demand dynamic that's completely in balance, probably more so than any other commodity on the planet in that, You've got 441 operating reactors, 56 new reactors in construction right now, and uh, and supply, 90% of the supply of, of fuel for those reactors comes from only 12 mines. So if you get one of those mines that goes down, that has an impact. If you get 12 of them that go down, you have a massive impact on supply. Uh, and uh, and that's what we've seen in, in recent weeks. Uh, you've seen Namibia close all of its production, Kazatomprom, uh, some interesting news out of Kazadam Prom yesterday. We were obviously watching the situation very closely. Kazadam Prom not only have closed all of their production, but of course that company is the biggest producer in the world. Uh, they've closed all of their production and they've said they're not going to supply the spot market this year. So that was massive news. And I think that hasn't been picked up by the media and, and most pundits out there just yet. So, so watch this space on that one. And then of course we saw Cameco close the giant cigar lake mine. So now they've got zero production. Uh, so it's a, it's a fascinating situation whereby you've seen really 50% of, of, uh, of supply knocked out of the market in one fell swoop. So, and it was already a market that was in dramatic undersupply. So, uh, and what we've seen uh, is of course, a very strong rising uh, uranium price. We've seen uranium jump from $23 a pound to $34 a pound today in the past three weeks. Uh, that makes uranium the number one performing commodity for the for the year. Uh, and um, and we uh, you know we expect more of that because really the the rise in price has just been the announcement and the threat of those closures. Uh, it, it hasn't related to any product drying up in the spot market. When that product dries up over the next couple of months, I think we'll see prices rise strongly. So uh, it's an interesting time. Mina, if you, if you just move on to that next slide, uh, I'll give uh, ISO Energy a very quick plug. We're a spin out of next gen energy, as, as Jochen says, we're exploring in the Athabasca Basin, which is home to the, the highest grade deposits and largest mines in the world. Uh, we're very close to, to Cameco's major mines there. La Rock East, our hurricane discovery, we discovered this back uh, two years ago. And, uh, and some of you will have noticed uh, on the, the OPAX uh, ranking of, of drill holes globally, our hole 32A, which we put out earlier this year, eight and a half metres, uh, uh, sorry, 34A, I should say, uh, eight and a half metres at 34% uranium, which sits at number one globally in any drill hole in any commodity in this, this past year. So uh, we're getting some tremendous results and we've now proven up a, a significant, significant deposit and we're working through those stages. We'll, we'll look to announce a resource uh, sometime early next year. Uh, Mina, I think there might be one more slide we can quickly get through there before we get back to Jochen. Thank you. Uh, and a little bit about the, the, the share structure, predominantly owned by NextGen Energy. NextGen owns 52% of us. We've got uh, Cameco and Arano, the other majors there as major shareholders, uh, and a number of very supportive institutional investors there. Uh, we're well funded for the, the coming year's programs, and we'll be drilling uh, come July back on that hurricane discovery and putting out more good results, I'm sure. So, so watch this space on that. Um, and, uh, you, you know, that's probably enough for me. I, I'd probably make two other points, actually, Joachim, before I, I go here. Um, a, apart from those closures and this change, dramatically changed supply-demand dynamic, the other thing we're observing right at the moment is a, a serious resurgence in uh, institutional investor interest in uranium. Um, I, I, I won't name the fund manager, but a pretty well-funded name... Uh, pretty well-known fund manager out there sent me a text overnight saying, hey, what's going on in uranium? Can you send me a uranium primer really quickly, please? <laughs> so, <laughs> you, you know, 
people people have forgotten a lot about uranium and since that last boom and um and and people are trying to get up to speed very quickly because the interest is mm. is getting uh you, you know re really resurging on being i've been very impressed with that and then that rising uranium price I think the other thing we're seeing out there is that the utilities, particularly in the US, are starting to worry and get nervous. And of course, the closure of Cigar Lake or the flooding of Cigar Lake back in 2006 really drove that crazy boom we saw in 2007 where, you know, I think the worst Rick Rule did in his investing at that time was 22 times his money on, on uranium companies, not 22%, 22 times his money was the very worst investment he made in that last boom. Um, you know, we can see a situation emerging where those US utilities and other utilities could start to panic by, mm. and, you know, I don't know where the Iranian price will go. I've been wrong consistently for the past five years on that, but, uh, you know, I would expect that we'll see 50 or $60 a pound before too long. And what we all know as investors is that commodities always overshoot on the upside. So could we see $100 Iranian in this next cycle? Absolutely, I think so. It's an exciting time to, yeah. to finally an exciting time to be in uranium. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm totally with you, Craig, and this uh, leads to my first question. Um, as I've uh, said in a video uh, last week, uh, which I recorded, do you uh, think that uh, what the Trump administration uh, is doing now from next year on for uh, $150 million per year, they want to buy US uranium, US region, so that's $1.5 billion. Let's put that uh, shortly aside, whoever decided it doesn't matter. But uh, to me, it looks a little bit like, is that something like an inflection point now for uranium? Because it brings the market in addition under pressure, meaning from the demand side, yeah, because they, they need a higher price. If you look, at, it doesn't matter, ISR producers, hard rock producers, $45, $50 is the minimum, what I see for the US. Maybe it's a little bit more, I don't know. But do you think that this, in addition, would cause like an yeah, inflection point, ignition point, whatever for the market? Look, it's certainly going to have some impact, you, you know, that extra demand. Um, no doubt about that. But, you, you know, honestly, it's, Jochen, it's, it's a fairly modest amount of extra demand that's driven by, by those changes. The most exciting thing about that nuclear fuel working group for us is that, uh, you, you know, the Trump administration is saying that they're not happy with securing supply from Russia, from mm -hmm. those, those big conversion fact, uh, systems in Russia and from China. And so at any point in the future, we could see supply cut off uh, you know, become illegal coming from those jurisdictions in, in the US. And that's a very big positive for Canadian producers because, of course, we're perfectly positioned to supply product into those big US utilities. And they are the, they're the, the main game in the Iranian world. They, they buy 40% of global product. Mm -hmm. Do you have any numbers on a net basis for the next years? Meaning, as you said, 50, 56 uh, nuclear power plants are in construction, but there are also some who are um, um, diminished, yeah, or let's say two who, who, are, um, who, um, who will brought down. And uh, also, uh, I mean, only stupid Germany has, uh, is closing their nuclear reactors. When uh, Merkel wants to have two million electro cars, they have to switch probably one or two on, uh, back on because uh, there is not, much, not enough power. So the point I'm making here is, what do you think on a net net basis for the next, let's say, five to 10 years will come into the world market? And I saw also here um, a question already from, uh, what is that, John Smoot, who is asking about the SMRs, about the small modular reactors. Do you think they will have an effect in the future too on the demand? Yeah, really, really good questions. Of course, you, you know, they're sort of medium to longer term drivers, those things. I think um, the, the supply demand dynamic changes dramatically over the next five to six years, whereby uh, I think, you know, supply has been growing steadily, although there are, a, you, you know, 10 percent of uh, increase in reactor build at the moment. So 441 to, to an additional 56 reactors over the next few years come online. There's been another 100 plus approved globally as well. China continues to develop and, and build reactors and commission reactors, a, uh, a new reactor every eight weeks at the moment, actually. Yeah. So demand's very good. I think, you, you know, currently global demand, 194 million pounds per annum. Uh, you can see that jumping to about 280 million pounds, according to UXC over the next uh, 10 years. And in that same time frame, we'll see 
you know, the closure of, uh, of Cigar Lake, the closure of MacArthur River, those Kazatom Prong projects, of course, in Kazakhstan there, ISR projects, which need reinvestment into well fields. Uh, and we can see that dropping off over that same time frame. So the supply demand dynamic changes dramatically. Of course, that 194 million pound per annum market today is only met by 120 million pounds of primary supply. So we're already in a fundamental undersupply situation. So things change very dramatically uh, over the next five to six years. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Chris is asking, what are the average mining costs and where we are currently? So my last information was $42 all in per pound. What Forty-two dollars. Well, look, yeah, and and that's about right. You know, in terms of a short answer, of course, Jochen, you've seen me complain about this long and hard that you know, I think investors need to hold our industry's feet to the flame because none of the producers out there quote all in sustaining costs. We're still quoting cash costs, and we don't know. You, you know depending on who it is, they're, they're C1, C2 or C3 cash costs. So no one gets a real, and, and if you're to go through those majors, financials and try and work out what the true cash cost, uh, true all in sustaining cost is, it's an incredibly difficult task. Uh, we think that the average is actually closer to 50 and certainly Cameco have been very vocal about this in recent times, that if they're gonna, you know, what they wanna do is write long-term contracts, and to do that, they've got to see a fifty uh, fifty dollar pound uh, per pound price at very minimum. So, you know, I think that's where things go in the short to medium term. But um, in terms of average average cost, we think somewhere 45, uh, 45 to fifty five, somewhere in that mm -hmm. range. So, uh, but interestingly enough, well, on an yep. all in sustaining basis, we think that because Adam Prom's production is probably around twenty five dollars a pound. So they've been losing money at recent spot prices as well. So clearly unsustainable. And we're now having that change that must come. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. So one last question. This is from Rama Amen from MMG Capital. If Kazadamprom changes its mind and increases production back up, will uranium prices collapse? Yeah, look, that's, that's a very good question. I think the fact that Kazadamprom, they've really shown their hand in the last, uh, last 24 hours. Uh, closing that production, we understand, of course, you, you know, former Soviet Union, I think I saw Peter Hambro, mining legend Peter Hambro on here, and he can talk a lot about this, but, um, you, you know, in former Soviet Union countries, your licences uh, mean you have to produce at that licensed rate, and Kazatomprom have been plagued by that problem for many years, that their licences meant that they're producing at that, that, that prescribed rate per the licence. Uh, and they've had, uh, a, a, and they've got to sell that product on the spot market. So some of those things have changed recently. We understand that they've got an agreement somehow with the government that these COVID nineteen related closures can be extended for a period of time. And so hence we think that they've announced a three month closure now. Uh, they're they they're not. And, and yesterday it came out that they're not going to uh, sell into the spot market at all this year. So that's massive, massive mm -hmm. news. Uh, and then later on, you know, well-field development, ISR production, you, you need to continuously keep developing those well-fields. And so that's a serious capital budget to do that. Uh, I, we don't believe that they're, they're dedicating capital to that right at the mm -hmm. moment. So there's something of a rundown of those resources uh, that they've got in the ground at the moment. So, uh, you know, um, uh, we're, we're not too worried about Kazadam Prom coming in mm -hmm. and flooding the market. Okay. Super, thank you. Andrew, is there time for one more question or because I know we are five minutes over already. Peter Hambro raised oh. his hand. I see that. Okay, yeah. Let me just see if I can just get Peter Hambro and Minna and, and then I. we have to move on, yeah. No, 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 no. We can get a question from Peter. I'm just trying to okay. unmute Peter. Um, I'm just trying to see him there in he is. the... Uh... Yeah, I think he's unmuted. Yeah. Okay, Peter, would you like to ask your question now? I, I wasn't really answering a question, trying, uh, sorry, asking a question, more to answer one. Having been working in the Soviet Union now for 25 years, um, the authorities are very, very understanding of, uh, of how difficult it is to, to mine and produce uh, what we do. And I see no reason why it should be any different for, for uranium. Um, uh -huh. we, have to, we have to produce uh, the, the uh, on balance gold in the ground um and but they don't have any uh say on the cost mm -hmm. okay 
Good. Thank you very much. So thanks, Craig Perry, uh, CEO from ISO Energy, and we're going to move on. And now let me introduce our third guest, Tommy Horton, who is Vice President Business Development of Gianni Metals and Chair Association of Mining Analysts. And uh, Gianni Metals is a publicly traded, well-managed junior resource company focused on building a superior mining company to supply manganese and also for the battery industry. So now we come to the green metals. Tommy, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, so Gianni Metals, um, uh, yeah, as you say, it's a manganese uh, development company. We're listed on the TSX. Uh, I literally uh, been with the company now for a couple of months and uh, yeah, it's, yeah, managing the business development side of the business. So yeah, the reason why I, I joined the company, I think it's, it's very exciting. You know, the EV space uh, looks, looks fantastic. I mean, you can, you can find many pieces of research that talk um, talk up a great game about lithium, cobalt, graphite, nickel, um, you know, even copper to a sort of lesser extent. No one really ever covers manganese. And it was quite interesting talking with one of the large research houses recently about, uh, you know, why, why, why don't you cover manganese? So, well, actually, because there's not that many juniors. And so from a business perspective, that's why we don't, we don't uh, look at it. But, you know, the, the potent, potential shortfall is, is just as large, if not larger, than the likes of, of, of cobalt um, and the rest. So that was one of the things that sort of drew me to, to Guiani. And so Guiani has, uh, we have an oxide manganese deposit in Southeast Botswana. We're very close to the South African border. And what, it, it's, it's not that we have like an ultra special um, ore body. Um, you know, the, the grade's decent, it's around 30%. It's oxide, which means it's easy to process, but it's, it's a number of things that sort of come together which make it uh, a, a very economical project. So our PEA, which uh, an updated version we announced, uh, had an 82% IRR, NPV uh, was 275 million US dollars, uh, and that's based on a, a nine to 10 year mine life. So the, the, the economics are incredibly robust, and that is, because we have a, a simple process, it's fairly off the shelf technology, it's SXEW. Um, and uh, we, are, we will be the only project that, um, once we get into production, that will be going from mine to refined metal manganese um, all in one place. Now, for those of you that don't really know the manganese market, 80 to 90%, it's close to 90% actually of, of all manganese, goes into the steel market, it's used to strengthen steel. And a large percentage of that manganese ore comes out of South Africa. And that's, a D, that's, that's all DSO. So it's, it's all mined, stuck on a rail cart, goes down to Port Elizabeth, and off it goes to China. What we're trying to do uh, is produce a refined, high purity manganese metal. And that high purity is 99.9% .9 manganese with very few deleterious elements. And there's actually two other non-Chinese uh, refiners of high purity manganese. So mm -hmm. as I said, most of this manganese ore goes, goes to China and it's processed into what's called EMM, electrolytic manganese metal. And it's, it's processed using selenium. Uh, and selenium is what brings down the cost and makes it economical for, for the Chinese to do that. Now you can't have selenium in a battery. Selenium is poisonous. And so, so the actual availability of high purity manganese that's selenium free, tiny. So that is where the huge advantage is, is for us. We, we have access to cheap power, given this SXEW, that's incredibly important. Um, we're not too far from the coast, so we can ship a refined product that is 99.9% you know, .9 down, to, down to the port. Um, and it's, you know, we've got a, we've got a high grade deposit, you know, sort of 30%. Um, and actually, the, you know, there's a huge amount of resource upside because we have three prospects there. We've only done the PEA on one of those prospects, which we call K Hill. And the other two are 20 to 25 kilometers down the road. Uh, one of them is uh, a lot higher grade and would make a significant impact on our, on our MPV to, to bring those into the, uh, into the, the, the project that we're doing at the moment and include that in the mine life. Um, so yeah, we're we're very excited by that, and you know what we're what we're finding the challenge is 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 educating people about manganese. Uh, as I mentioned, not many people have uh, 
have heard about it, uh, understand it, um, but uh, we think we're well ahead of the curve. There's not many other junior manganese producer or uh, developers or even producers that are listed, but uh, other developers especially that are, have seen what we've seen. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, I'm incredibly excited and that's yeah, why I joined the company. Super, great. Tommy, thank you very much. There is uh, Andrew and Mina, there's uh, Tiago Hornos from Blast Trade Brazil who raised the hand. Can you give him uh, please the microphone? Tiago? Tiago, uh, the floor is yours. Can, can you hear me all? Okay, yeah, that's okay. good. The question is about the manganese. Um, you mentioned about 30%. Um, how do you come up from 30% to 95% for the el electrolytic uh, manganese for the batteries? Because the electrolytic, electrolytic is a small percentage of the market. It's yeah, that's correct. It is for the, as you said, right, for the steel. So would you be considering uh, investing in manganese in other countries? Uh, for example, right, ready stockpiles, like a few million tons. Uh, would you be interested in, in getting this kind of material with 35% purity? So those are the well, questions I, mean, I have. You know, the advantages that we have is... We have that investment in place. So the, yeah, the advantage that we have is that we have everything on site uh, and so we don't have to move material so it's not expensive. Um, so, you know, we are moving, you know, ore that is, what, 30% material down the road, you know, within a, you know, a kilometre or two. Uh, we are crushing, grinding, um, uh, re re go through a reduction process, neutralization, and then it's solvent extraction and electro winning. And, and, and that, that is where we create the huge margin is, is by having everything all on spot or all, all on in one place. I mean, there is, there is an international market for uh, high purity manganese metal and the likes of MMC in South Africa uh, 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 and there's plenty in China that will take manganese ore and, and process it and try and produce EMM uh, and or, uh, you know, even the high purity version. But, you know, for, for us, we're not, we're not interested in, in, in taking other people's feedstock because you know, what, what's important for us is that we have an oxide deposit of a decent grade. It's not a carbonate deposit, and that's really important. Uh, it's an oxide deposit. So the reductant process uh, involves sucrose, which is sugar, basically. Um, okay. So we don't have to go through a cal calcining process. So, so calcining is basically stick it in an oven at a very high temperature, well over a thousand degrees. And um, a lot of the carbonate ores have to do that, or the carbonate ores do have to do that. And so where we appeal to the European battery manufacturers <laughs> is the fact that A, we have a very low car carbon footprint because um, we don't have to go through that calcining process. Uh, and B, we're non-Chinese. And as I said, there is two other um, non-Chinese producers of the high purity EMM, electrolytic manganese metal. Uh, and in order for their, to reduce their own supply risk, they, they want supply that is, is outside of China. So that's, that's why from the end customers, we've, we've had a lot of uh, potential uh, interest. And um, yeah, hopefully over the course of this year, we'll, we'll be converting that into uh, yeah, some, some strategic partnerships or offtake. Mm -hmm. uh, Tommy, also there's a question here from a participant. What is the world demand for EMM, meaning then for your product on the one hand and on the other hand question from my side, how do you think uh, the, let's say, revolution of uh, electric uh, mobilization uh, on our roads will change the whole demand in the, let's say, perspective of the next five to 10 years? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's huge. Um, uh, I mean, we have a slide on this and I'm trying to remember what the numbers off the top of my head, but uh, uh, essentially you've got a huge shortfall in, in manganese uh, as you do with all the other battery metals. And um, yeah, we, I, uh, basically as the gigafactory capacity goes up, you get the economies of scale, which drop the dollar per um, sell down to you know, hundred dollars and the hundred dollars, which we're not far off at the moment. Um, the hundred dollar mark is where you're basically producing. Uh, it's that magic figure where you're basically producing an internal combustion, combustion engine car at the same price as you would be a battery electric car. And as soon as you get over that range anxiety with the sort of NMC 811 batteries or 532 batteries, you, you start seeing like potential for mass adoption. You know, the ongoing costs of 
running an electric car are far less than, than running a, uh, the internal combustion engine car. So um, the, the size of the EMM market at the moment is small. Um, uh, it is, I think it's around 60 to 70,000 tons per annum. Um, but, you know, that's come off a very low base, you know, and it's, it's going to be well over 100, 150 within the next two, three years. Uh, so that, that's, that's the real fuel in the fire. Um, and, you know, that's why we believe we're, you know, mm -hmm. we'll be one of the first mover advantage, we'll have that first mover advantage rather. Yeah. Okay. And my friend Jay Robert has a question to you, Tommy. What is the relationship with Trexis? Ah, uh, fellow shareholder. Um, so uh, the relationship with Traxxas is on the DSO. So you actually asked a very good question. So uh, I will I'll do a slight diatribe first. So the three prospects that we have have old workings. So they're back pre-independence of Botswana. There was uh, mining um, of the high-grade manganese that was there, and it was used. Um, yeah, it was used through the colonies. Anyway, an independence in 1966 basically. Um, operation stopped, but they left. Uh, there's a number of stockpiles that have been left. Um, and there's also sort of remediation work that we can do related to those stockpiles that we can sell to the market. So one thing that's really exciting at the moment is as a result of this issue with COVID, um, South Africa has gone into lockdown. And South Africa supplies a vast majority of uh, manganese to the international market. Well, no manganese has been moving out of South Africa for the last six, seven weeks. Mm -hmm. And so the price has doubled in the last three weeks, right? So, for, and that's manganese ore. So I've got to be, I've got to, you know, be clear that that ang that's manganese ore rather than manganese refined metal. So there's a slight difference. But we will be selling a, on a DSO basis some manganese ore from our stockpiles, and we'll be monetizing that to um, help with our project development costs. So we're lucky in that respect um, that we can, uh, rather than than you know. Um, yeah, rather than having uh, hugely dilutive financings, we can rely on the, on the cash flow from from this from the manganese stockpiles. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I didn't really answer the question. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so, tr the relation with Traxxas is <laughs> Traxxas. We signed an LOI with Traxxas last year on, on on the offtake of that stockpile material, uh, and they also had a first right of refusal on the EMM. We're still continuing those conversations, but we're um, we're looking to advance that DSO project. Uh, in the next three months, which is when we think we'll be able to truck cross-border, uh, easily truck cross-border from Botswana into South Africa. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, Tommy, thank you very much. And just uh, maybe one comment from my side, do you know what we call Botswana? It's the Switzerland of Africa, just that you know. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Don't disagree, it's, it's, uh, it's not easy to uh, They're all very well educated and, uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, they go to Botswana to store their money. Fantastic. Super. Tommy, thank you very much. Enjoy your beer. Great uh, presentation. And yeah, let's move on. Before we come to David Sweet, we have an, uh, our third polling. Mina, maybe you want to bring that up. What sort of economic downturn will COVID-19 cause? Short shock, recession, or depression? Depression we don't like, of course. <laughs> so please. Oh, ha. Jesus. Are you so pessimistic? My goodness, you need a lot of alcohol, probably. <laughs> hi, 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 hi. <laughs> I go for the short shock, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, super. So while you are polling, um, I want to uh, yeah, um, introduce uh, David Street. And uh, David Street uh, has had a 15-year career in the natural resource finance, including stints at NM Rothschild and Endeavor Financial. David uh, co-founded Tempo Capital along with Peter Ruxton and John Hodder. And David, before the floor is yours, give me 20 seconds. Now we want to end the poll. And so how does it look like? Okay, recession, six to 18 months. Okay, so you finally made it to a little bit more balance. That's good because the present always shocks me a little bit. So let's end that poll here. And David, the floor is yours, please. Sure, that, I, I was uh, six to 12 months there as well. I think that's the <laughs> middle of the road answer, yeah. And that means you need more red wine, that's okay. <laughs> uh, I've, got a beer, I've got a beer here, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm doing, yeah. <laughs> um, now, thanks very much. Uh, I think most people will know Tembo, but we're uh, a strategic equity investor in a number of small mining companies. Um, 
around the world, both public and private companies. We typically own 10, 20, 30 percent of, of different companies. Uh, we have a number of funds, closed-ended long-term funds. Um, and commodity-wise, we're, we're particularly interested in gold and uh, uh, base metals, particularly copper. Um, we are a very interesting conversation about uranium earlier. And we have been uh, very uh, bullish and positive about uranium for a while, Craig. Uh, so uh, good to see some of the numbers there, which look quite familiar. Um, uh, and hopefully the, that market is something of a uh, coil spring at the moment. And we're, we're seeing good increases in it. Um, I, th I think generally, uh, I mean, probably the, 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 the question I, I was asked really was economic view and um, an outlook from here. Uh, I think um, I think particularly interesting market for gold at the moment. I've been in the gold market and around the gold market with Rothschilds and, and other people for most of my career. And I think it's one of the most bullish times, I think, for, for the gold market that I've seen uh, with the printing of money that's going on. I think that probably cascades over into silver, as we said at the, at the outset, in terms of the gold-silver ratio, which is at an, an all-time uh, high currently. Um, medium term, we, we like copper uh, very much from here. Um, uh, in, in, you know, probably on the six to twelve month view, I think I think it's hard not to be very bullish on copper. Uh, and uh, uranium is the other is the other commodity that, that we're interested in. But I, I think um, I, I think it's a very interesting time for the market. I think there's a lot of interesting uh, uh, angles to play on commodities, and, and despite the, the the news here actually I actually think broader equity markets are probably at, at, at a surprisingly high level right now but um, uh, given the shock the world's had but I, uh, medium term I think is really interesting I think we could see some inflation coming into the system for a, a variety of uh, sources um, and I, I th I'm pretty bullish across the commodity spectrum uh, on, on a you know two three year horizon Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. That leads that leads to my first question, of course. What is your price target for gold and maybe also for silver, let's say, end of next year? Cool. Uh, <laughs> we don't really have... I, I, know, I know you sold your crystal ball last week, but uh, just... Uh, yeah, uh, I, 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 th I think it's quite likely to see gold trade up through 2000 from here. Uh, I, I, I'd, be, I'd be pretty bullish on that. Um, uh, uh, you know, it, 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 interested in, in, your, in your views there as well. Oh, well, I've done last week uh, my point and figure analysis, which uh, you can watch on Commodity TV. And my target on point and figure charts is 2,440. Mm. And uh, also, I'm quite bullish for silver also, honestly. Mm. But it, it can go much higher. My super long-term <laughs> target also derived from point and figure is actually 8,600. But I'm probably pretty alone in the world with that target. But uh, this is... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that would be fantastic. I'm just going to unmute Peter Hambro. <laughs> yes, please. Where is he? Oh, it's not working for some reason. Sorry, bear with me one second. I don't know why. That Maybe uh, no. now it works. Peter, no, it you're Peter. Li live again. Okay. Um, I've been looking at it because I'm sitting here in Berkshire at lockdown and I bought my first gold from Rothschilds uh, in about 1973. I bought uh, a pack of 10 Kruger rands and I paid $36 an ounce for it. Well done. And if you look at the, I, I, I hate to tell you, I sold, it for, I sold them for 110, thought I was clever. Um, but so in my business lifetime, uh, gold has increased in value by uh, a fantastic, a, a, a fantastic amount. And uh, if, in, if you look at the, if it did the same over the next 50 odd years, it would be something over 80,000. Mm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, should, you shouldn't forget that it can move very fast. And, it, and, it, <clears throat> and it's done this move. Mm -hmm. Without any serious problems, that we've had no rats, no no civil wars. Um, so 
I think your eight thousand is probably quite quite cheap. Mm -hmm. Then I, I have a question for both of you, probably, uh, which um, just came up to me here to my mind, because I was uh, yeah reading about uh, Chicago Mercantile Exchange, about the life, etc. That uh, even alone in London, you need to deliver by for the next future contract over 300 tons physically, uh, if they would exercise that. So, what is your view on, let's say, the future market? The impact on the spot price finally and uh, do you think uh, as they have changed the rules immediately just so that they can still settle uh, cash um, do you think stuff could happen like uh, vice versa what we saw in the oil price or finally at, at oil you, you had to pay that you have got rid of it i think uh, now maybe it's uh, vice versa in the gold market what do you um, think david or peter even yeah please i i think i've always thought it is a very real uh, prospect, but one should, <laughs> history, history as we know, um, is a great predictor of the future. And we shouldn't forget that um, when the hunts cornered the silver market, um, Comex just changed the rules. So um, uh, that's what will happen. And I think that there will be a financial closeout um, uh, for the <clears throat> for the people who are long. So uh, in all, otherwise, Comex will go bust. <laughs> Mm. Hi. Hi there, mm. Peter. Uh, hi. Uh, hi. Um, look, I, I, I look at it a little, little bit more broadly. Um, I think uh, short-term, very interesting for gold, uh, as, as we've just outlined. I think medium-term, uh, you can see a, a number of inflationary uh, forces coming into the market. I think um, you, you're likely to see a lot more regionalization in terms of production and, and industrial output. Um, and one of the key sort of forces on uh, reducing inflation over the last 20, 20 or 30 years has, has been the globalization and the just-in-time kind of network of purchasing uh, and running economies with very low levels of stock. Um, I think um, you know there's, there's been some numbers put out, put around uh, by the IMF by, by this, but over that period, inflation has has been taken out of the system to around about one percent per annum. Um, and I think, I think with some of the geopolitical changes that you're likely to see going forward over the next um, few years as a result of what's happened you know, in, in in the recent past here, uh, I, I think you're likely to see more inflation coming into the system uh, once the shock effect is over. Um, uh, and I think that's good for the whole commodity complex, to be honest, uh, particularly for gold, but also more broadly. Uh, I think it's a very interesting time for commodities at the moment. Uh, it has a, lot, a number of parallels to the end of the financial crisis period, in my opinion. Uh -huh. Great. Do we have uh, any more questions? Yeah, here, Philip Hopwood. Was there a finger uh, raising? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I so, David, very interesting in, in your views there. So, I, th I think everybody's kind of bullish on, on commodities, gold, silver. I always like to hear silver doing well. But um, what about getting an investment into this sector? I mean, from, from what I'm hearing is that people are very nervous, unless you've got an existing relationship with, a, uh, with an investor. How do we attract new investors into this market, especially right now, where we're all kind of a lockdown like this? You know, I see a lot of people sitting on the sidelines waiting. I think I think it's a good question, and I think um, uh, I, I think it is hard to to attract new investors. I think um, I think capital is short, and investors can be quite picky about the projects and companies that they invest in. And generally, in these sorts of periods of time, we, we, we've gone through a period of time where there haven't been many generalist investors in the mining industry, uh, relatively speaking, relative to it's been an underperforming industry relative to other industries, particularly technology. And I think hopefully over this next uh, period of time, more generalist investors will come back into the sector. I think, though, that when they do, the first port of call for them is in the big cap companies. And then gradually that kind of uh, uh, filters down to smaller producers and, and, and so on. And I don't think we're there yet. Uh, but, you know, it, 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 my view and what we do at Tembo, we invest in smaller companies, smaller assets, and we try to advance those companies and assets 
uh, adding value to them uh, and ultimately uh, we'll the, the sell stakes in, in those companies or, or quite often they, they'll be bought by bigger mining companies because the, the pipeline of assets available to large mining companies is actually quite thin with the, with the period of time that we've had uh, over the last 10 you know, years or so, not much money has been spent on, on earlier stage project development, drilling, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, what, is your, what is your average holding period of your investments normally? Probably four or five years on, 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 on average. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. So yeah, that means yeah. that, you, that you don't care if you start with an investment about liquidity. For you, it's important that you are developing your investments, right? Yeah, we, we've got long-term closed-ended funds. So um, we, we, we have the luxury of time, if you like. But we need to make sure that the projects are advanced efficiently. There's not too much dilution to, to shareholders. Um, and that we're adding value to those projects as we go along. We have... Uh, quite a significant investment in a uranium company. Um, uh, hard to call the timing exactly right on these things, but we, are, we you know, we are interested in uranium in the medium term. Uh, mm -hmm. A number of other investments in gold, copper, uh, other, other other assets, and we'll either take them through to feasibility study stage, or some of them we take them from feasibility study into production. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, ISO Energy is a great investment opportunity. Um, so what I, <laughs> what I wanted to ask you also, as you are quite deep in the markets, um, what is your expectation about M&A consolidation? Because uh, I think there are, there are some quite uh, famous charts, which we saw all from Bank of America, BMO, etc. cetera. And uh, the, let's say, for example, gold production is going down in the next five years by at least 20%. Yeah? We have seen uranium mm -hmm. production is going really down um, to the closures and stuff. Um, there, there's no new mine development. I think we are missing at least 500,000 tons of copper every year now just to fulfill, let's say, the normal growth space. Of course, not for this year because that's a recession year. But uh, if we take it as an average, so what do you think about M&A? Do you think that the big, the, the, the majors are really under heavy pressure that they have to upload uh, again with growth opportunities? Or do you think hmm, maybe they take some time and they take the time to explore themselves and to develop themselves through organic yeah. growth? Yeah, no, good, good question. I, I think um, I think you're already seeing significant M and A and consolidation in the gold sector, and mm -hmm. it has rewarded those companies that have uh, participated in those types of deals and quite a few kind of no, nil premium deals. And the shareholders on both sides have actually benefited from those deals. And I think that that will continue. And you're seeing that even through the financial crisis with companies like Endeavor buying Semifo. Uh, yeah. And I, I think you will definitely see more consolidation in the gold sector. I think there's a drive for companies to trade up in terms of uh, smaller one asset companies, obviously trade on a lower price to nav than uh, mid tier companies with a number of assets. So that that is here to stay. And I think that that carries on happening. Um, mm -hmm. I think um, uh, base metals and other 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 um, uh, commodities it's a bit it's a bit more nuanced uh, i think there are there is a real dearth of copper projects and assets out there and i think that's an interesting area to be in and you've seen the likes of rio and other big players who are clearly looking around for how to um get into the copper market and their traditional hurdle for a copper acquisition would have been you know 80 100,000 tons they said publicly last year that they were looking at smaller producing assets um, because there just aren't bigger ones around. Uh, so they would they would look at smaller ones with low capital intensity ratios. So I think that's indicative of where the market is. Um, I think other base metals probably are a bit slower to follow that on, possibly with the exception of nickel. Um, uh -huh. uh, but the other thing I would say relative to the last financial crisis the, the, my, the large mining companies coming out of this in financially very good shape. You know, they have relatively strong balance sheets. They're doing well. Rio and BHP are two of the few companies on the London Stock Exchange carrying on paying dividends. Um, uh, so I would think that, you know, you might see a move back towards growth and M&A quicker in the mining sector than in other sectors, frankly. Mm, so that would also help the average stock prices. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Super. Are there any more questions? Andrew, Mina, do you see anything here? Somebody waving? No, I don't yeah, see anyone waving. I just no. checked. Tommy, you wanted to say something? Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about your uh, your uranium holding. How how uh, how long do you reckon it would take to get that back into production? Uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. I'll disclose because it's public. Uh, uh, so we have a quite large position in a company called Paladin, uh, which mm. is a big asset uh, and quick to get it back into production, big production, um, and. Uh, I, I look. I think we think the uranium market is very interesting from from where it is today, and that's a relatively uh, large asset, um, a relatively low cost asset to 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 restart. What price do you need to go back? Is today already uh, good? Yeah, I, I, look, I, th I I think it's it's fair to say. It, I'm not speaking for the company, but I think it's fair to say uh, it's one of the lower cost producers when it comes back online. So, it likely okay. would be one of the first mines to be brought back on. Okay, good. Perfect. All right, super. Hey, then thank you very much to everybody, all our participants. Also, thank you to you, David. Uh, great uh, presentation and talking to you. Also, Craig, thank you very much. ISO Energy. Thorsten, thank you very much uh, for your insights. And Tommy also about Gianni. Now I say it correct. I said Gianni, but it's Gianni Metals. And uh, yeah, thanks uh, everybody for participating. My gin tonic actually is empty. That's a real disaster. <laughs> and uh, for those uh, who have voted on the press Please don't jump. Okay? Don't jump. It's going <laughs> over. It's not worth it. <laughs> and uh, it will go faster over than we all think. And uh, I wish everybody really good health and stay healthy. That's the most important things, uh, thing today. And uh, make sure that you and your families are fine. I wish you a wonderful weekend because uh, Great Britain has a holiday already tomorrow. So it's with the Swiss are working, of course. We have to contribute to the GDP. And uh, so we have we still get a good uh, growth rate here this year, for sure, because we all work. And uh, <laughs> I wish you all the best. The and, and bank and holidays in Europe. So we're, um, we're working away. We, honestly, we don't have bank holidays because the banks are all so weak. They cannot go on holiday. It's not possible. <laughs> <laughs> it's called home office today. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so Andrew, I'd, the floor I'd, is I'd, yours. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'd um, just like to add, like, add my thanks to Jochen and, and all the panelists and all the audience for dialing in. Just before we go, just a few announcements. Um, next Thursday at 7 p.m. Uh, British Summertime, there's going to be a pub quiz organised by Young Mining Professionals and the Association of Mining Analysts. Uh, Tommy Horton, you're obviously the chair of the Association of Mining Analysts. How do people go and sign up? Yeah, so uh, if you go onto LinkedIn and so, uh, search for the Association Mining Analysts, I put a post up literally just before this, uh, this started. So there's a link there to sign up and it's, it's going to be a, a Zoom type uh, format. I think we're going to use SurveyMonkey for the results. Who knows what's going to happen? Anything can happen. But uh, we're, we're just going to, we've got a lot of idle people who know a lot about mining. So we thought it'd be a good opportunity to test them. And it's great to be uh, teaming up with YMP. And uh, yeah, so hopefully see you there at 7 p.m. Um, next Thursday. And don't forget, bring your own booze. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. And then our next episode on the 21st of May will also be hosted by Jochen, another star studded lineup. Jonathan Goodman from Dundee Corporation, Bradford Cook and Deborah Silver, Tim Warman uh, from Field Gold and Matt Geiger from MJG uh, Capital. So um, without sort of further ado, I've been allowed to get back to your like evenings ahead of you. Wish you all a good sort of like uh, evening. Thank you very much for like uh, joining us and go and see you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.